Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. I hope you've all had a good week. So today we are going to be talking about one of the most unthinkable crimes and that is when a child kills another child. Today we are going to be covering the case of Eric Smith who when he was only 13 years old carried out an absolutely horrific act. You can label me a monster, cold-blooded killer, uh, demon child, Satan incarnate. I don't care what the name you give me. And when crimes like this do happen, when the perpetrator is so young, as you can imagine, they become a little bit of a media sensation. We actually have a very similar case in the UK to Eric Smith, which is the case of James Bulger. And if you are in the UK, I am sure you know what that case is. In that case, it was two 10 year olds that murdered two year old James Bulger. And another very tragic similarity between the two cases is that the victim in today's case was so young. The victim was just four years old and that four-year-old little boy was Derek Roby. But the main question when it comes to cases like this, when a child does commit murder, what happens? Like what punishment should they get? Can they be rehabilitated? Can they be released? And those questions are actually very significant in today's case because Eric Smith was making headlines once again last year when he came up for parole. I'm not the same person. So that is the case that we are going to be covering today. It's not going to be easy to listen to. This case is not going to be for everyone. But with all of that being said, let's jump in. So I just wanted to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is Love and Pies. Love and Pies is a free to download merge to mobile game where you play as single mom Amelia Green who is trying to restore an old family cafe and build a thriving business. So the aim of the game is to combine tasty treats into finished products and then you serve your cafe customers, earn money, renovate and design and restore the family cafe. And this game, I have fallen in love with it. It's the kind of game that as soon as you start playing it, you can't put it down. I just love the satisfaction of getting the ingredients, combining them to make a product and then serving the customers. I get so much satisfaction from that. I love it. It almost makes me feel like I have my own cafe. The game also has an amazing storyline. There are some intriguing mysteries to solve. Some dark family secrets get un covered and there's also a bit of romance in there as well hence the name of the game love and pies and also there is an amazing and diverse cast of characters in the game but possibly my favorite thing about the game is renovating and decorating my cafe and you guys know that i love to design and decorate even though i'm not always the best at it so this is my cafe so far i have a little decking with the little chairs and tables outside and then like this is the inside of my cafe you can still that some work needs to be done and then you can see that the other rooms there they need to be restored and renovated but that is the aim of the game you combine your ingredients here you serve your customers at the top you earn money and then you renovate and design your cafe along the way and honestly I'm so excited to see what my cafe is going to look like and I just love playing games like this where I can completely escape I can immerse myself into a world I'm building my cafe I'm having a thriving business it's from an amazing British games company company as well which I love and if you are like me and you like decorating little worlds and you also like the idea of serving customers in your cafe then I think you're going to love it and I highly recommend this game and if you wanted to play Love and Pies for yourself you can download the game for free by going to the link in my description box and using that link in the description box rather than going to the app store really does help out this channel so again if you want to play Love and Pies for free go to the link in my description box so thank you again to Love and Pies for sponsoring today's video and making this video possible but thank you to every single one of you watching right now because without all of you guys I wouldn't get opportunities like this and now let's jump into today's case. Eric Smith was born on the 22nd of January 1980 making him an Aquarius where he grew up in a very small town of Savona, New York. And he lived with his mom, Tammy, his stepdad, Ted, and then his two other siblings. Now, Eric's family dynamic setup 
is a little bit confusing, so I'm going to try and explain it as simply as possible. But there were issues in Eric's life before he was even born. So first of all, his mom, Tammy, when she was pregnant with Eric, was in the process of getting a divorce from her husband, Randy. Now, she already had a child with Randy, a daughter called Stacy, but she was pregnant with Eric when they were going through the divorce, and Randy was trying to claim that he wasn't the father of Eric. Eric. So in the end, she took him to court and she was like, you know what? I'm going to prove it to you that Eric is yours. They had a paternity test and it was proven that Randy was Eric's father. But even though it was proven that Randy was Eric's father, he still didn't want anything to do with Eric, which I just don't understand because Randy did have somewhat of a relationship with his other child, Stacy, but for some reason, he just didn't even want to acknowledge Eric at all. So during the divorce proceedings, which were pretty dragged out because of all this mess, in the process, Tammy had actually met another man called Ted Smith. And as soon as her divorce was final, she pretty much straight away got married to Ted Smith. Now, Ted really stepped up into being a father and he legally adopted Eric. So even though he is his stepdad, he is legally his dad. So it is very confusing. But Eric growing up did think that Ted was his biological father, which obviously he's not. But the reason why I've had to explain all of this is because the daddy issues and all of this drama does come back up. But that wasn't the only problem for Eric, before he was even born. So his mom, Tammy, suffered from epilepsy and she had to take medication for her epilepsy. And she continued to take this medication when she was pregnant, but the medication that she was on was known to cause fetal damage. And even though it hasn't been proven 100%, it is thought that because Tammy took this medication, it did have an effect on Eric's development, which it kind of seems like it did. And you will understand why, because he does seem to have some development issues. So yes, that is what happened before Eric was even born. Okay, so now Eric is born and there's not really much to talk about in his very early years. However, when he was two years old, it was becoming evident that he was developing slower than other children. Even though he was two years old, he still couldn't walk or talk. But the fact that Eric hadn't even started to even say any word or walk was definitely concerning. Now, he did eventually start walking and talking somewhere between the ages of two to three, but even still, there were problems. And that was with Eric's behavior. He would have regular daily tantrums, which uh, is not uncommon for children. However, Eric's tantrums, they went like a lot further. Almost on a daily basis, a part of his tantrums, he would bang his head repeatedly off a wall or the floor. He would also hold his breath for a ridiculously long time until he got what he wanted. And when I read that he repeatedly banged his head on the floor and the walls, he was doing it pretty hard. I just kept thinking, is he doing damage? Like, is he possibly giving himself a small head injury? And then at the age of three, Eric becomes fascinated with fire, which is a bit young, isn't it? It, it it is. There was one time where he was three years old and he got up in the middle of the night. He went into the kitchen. He gathered up a pile of papers and set them on fire using the kitchen stove. Now I have a lot of questions. Why the hell does a three-year-old have access to a kitchen stove? Is he climbing on things? But why is a three-year-old doing that? That is not normal behavior. Mm -mm, no. Now, thankfully, no harm was done. The parents clearly saw him doing this or heard him, but the red flags don't stop there. Oh no. At the age of four years old, he was apparently thinking about girls and, um, I do mean it in a sexual way. And it's like, um, no, 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 no. But why is a four-year-old thinking like that? What are they possibly being exposed to? And then at the age of five, Eric started wetting the bed and he continued to wet the bed until he was 11 years old. I bet you're thinking, okay, bed wetting, obsession with fire. Is he going to complete the McDonald triad? And the answer to that would be 
Yes. Eric also had an interest in harming and killing small animals from a very, very young age. So he completes the McDonald triad. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on what it is, but basically if you have those three things, bedwetting, fire starting, or obsession with fire, and harming animals, there has been research to think that that could lead to murder down the line. But then there's just one more thing, is that by the age of nine, Eric was a heavy smoker. And you heard that right, nine years old. Nine years old and Eric is smoking a pack of cigarettes every single day. Again, I have questions. Who is buying these cigarettes? Because I'm sorry, he's nine years old. He probably doesn't have a lot of money. How is he introduced to cigarettes in the first place? As far as I could tell from my research, none of his friends smoked. Again, what is he being exposed to in the home? I don't know. I just have these questions. And he wouldn't do this secretly, the smoking. He would just whip out a cigarette all the time. He would whip his cigarettes out in front of his friends, parents. So those were some of the issues that he had in childhood and at home. There are a few more, but we need to get on to his school life because his school life and what happened to him at school is actually very, very significant because Eric would actually blame what he did later on because of what happened to him at school. And to say that Eric had a bad time at school is probably an understatement. He was severely bullied, which I do always hate. I hate bullying. Oh my God. God, kids are so bloody mean. But the thing with Eric is that he wasn't just picked on by the bullies, you know, like the typical bullies. Eric was picked on by pretty much everyone. One of the reasons why Eric was picked on is because of some of the developmental problems that we spoke on earlier. Eric was still developing at a slower pace to his peers. He was held back in the first grade and the fifth grade, but he wasn't just two grades behind. It is all also said that Eric, even at 13 years old, had a mental age of somebody that was eight or nine years old. And the bullies really pounced on this. They would call him stupid and slow. Pretty much every time he opened his mouth, he was ridiculed. Eric also had a speech defect. And up until the age of nine, every time he spoke, he drooled. But again, this was something else that the bullies just jumped on and absolutely ridiculed him for. But then the second reason, and possibly the main reason why Eric was bullied. And that was for the stereotypical reason and a reason that I absolutely hate. And that is because of how Eric looked. Eric had very thick, very bright red hair. He had a face full of freckles. His ears were set slightly lower than normal. And because of his poor eyesight, he had to wear very thick rimmed glasses. And there was nothing wrong with any of this, but we know how kids are. It really breaks my heart when anyone is bullied, especially because of the way they look. I mean, I'm sure, unfortunately, a lot of us can relate to that. I was picked on when I was younger because I did have a face full of freckles. And Eric would quite often be seen crying in the corner, which would only make the bullying worse. And Eric really did try to fit in. He tried to to join the sports teams because he thought that that would make him cool and people would like him. He tried to hang out at the local parks, but no one ever accepted him. He barely had any friends and any girls that he was interested in would just laugh at him and ridicule him. And a lot of the time, Eric was just seen on his bike, riding around the neighborhood on his own. And this just made Eric completely depressed. He just felt so alone. All he wanted was to be accepted. And Eric would often be seen scratching his own face out of school photos. So Eric had it pretty rough at school. There is no denying that. But you can feel sorry for him when he is at school, when he is going through this, and also not make excuses for what he did. You can feel those two things at the same time. So that was Eric's school life. And now we need to get back to Eric's home life because there are a couple more things that happen. And this is where we have to return to the daddy issues. So remember I said that Eric, from the moment he was born, he believed that his 
stepdad, Ted, was actually his biological dad. Well, one day in school, one of his many bullies started teasing him about the fact that Ted wasn't his real dad. But Eric was getting really upset about this because he truly believed that Ted was his dad. And this is when Eric's mom, Tammy, and his stepdad, Ted, decide to come clean to Eric and tell him that Ted is not his real dad. Now, Eric is absolutely shocked by this and heartbroken his whole world has just completely turned upside down. And then this is where it kind of gets confusing. And this is where Randy, the biological dad, the actual biological dad comes back into it. So remember that Tammy also has another child with Randy, Stacy. Well, Stacy has continued on having a relationship with her dad, Randy. And Eric knew who Randy was because Randy would sometimes come to the home and pick up his daughter, spend some time with Stacy. But Eric knew Randy as Stacy's dad. But now Eric has just been told that his real dad is Randy. But not just that. No, that is not even the worst of it. Because even after Eric has found out that Randy is his biological dad, Randy still wants nothing to do with Eric, which I just don't get. It's like he is still having a relationship with his daughter. Why don't you also have a relationship with your son that also lives in the same home? So Eric is feeling abandoned right now. Eric, understandably so, just couldn't get his head around the fact that his dad, his biological dad, didn't want a relationship with him. So that was the first issue at home, the whole issues with his biological dad. But now we need to get onto the issues with his stepdad, Ted, because you might have been thinking that Ted was a good guy. I mean, he stepped up being a dad. He legally adopted Eric when his own dad didn't want anything to do with him. Ted is a stand-up guy. No, no. Ted had a reported hot temper and he would be quick to dish out verbal punishments, but these would sometimes be physical punishments as well. But it wasn't just his own kids that Ted would lose his temper with. Ted would also completely lose it with the kids in the neighborhood. He was just one of those people that you would avoid. And as a child, you would be scared of them. And people in the neighborhood would see Ted be physical with Eric. They would see Ted grab Eric violently and like push, shove him and kick him. And like I have said before, if he is willing to do that, in public, what is he doing in private? Well, we actually do know what he does in private. And let me just say he's a scumbag. Even though this hasn't been confirmed, it is thought that Ted was also physically abusing his wife, Tammy. And given the fact that he abuses his children, it's not too far to assume that he also abuses his wife. And if that is true, Eric and the rest of the children, but Eric would have seen quite a lot. He is already seen quite a lot, but that is not the worst of it. Oh no. Ted was also sexually abusing Stacy, who is the oldest child in the house. Stacy is Ted's stepdaughter. At the age of 16, Stacy came forward and told people that Ted had sexually abused her when she was 14, but also when she was 11. Now, initially, Ted flat out refused. He was like, uh-uh, no, I did not do that. He denied everything. He tried to shut everything down. But then Ted actually admits to doing this. But he was like, I only did it once though. So it's not that bad. It's like, Ted, it doesn't matter. Even if you did only do it once, you still did it. Following this, following the revelation, the family did go to counseling. To be honest, Ted should have gone to prison, but that's just me. And Tammy... <laughs> I get that she is also possibly being abused, but she decided to side with her husband, the abuser. And because she sided with her husband, Stacy, the victim in all of this, ended up moving out and moving in with her biological father, Randy. And then finally, again, this has not been confirmed. However, there is a lot of speculation surrounding this. There is speculation that possibly Eric was also sexually abused by Ted. Now, Ted has denied this and Eric has also denied this himself. But given what Eric goes on to do, there is speculation that this could have happened. So now we get to 
1993. Eric is currently 13 years old and we are getting closer and closer to the tragic events of today's case. Now, at this point in Eric's life, things really did start to unravel. I mean, they already kind of have, but they're starting to unravel even more. He is still being bullied. We know that there are still issues in the home. But remember earlier on, I said that Eric liked to harm small animals. Well, this is where that really starts to escalate. And I've got to give a trigger warning here because we are going to be talking about animal abuse. So first of all, Eric got this weird satisfaction by killing wild snakes, which is just horrific. He actually got pleasure out of killing an animal. But it wasn't just snakes, it was other small animals. And then it escalated to cats. His neighbor actually had cats. And one day, Eric enticed the neighbor's cat into his backyard and placed a metal clamp around the cat's neck. And he tightened this clamp until the cat died of asphyxiation. And I just can't believe it. Like I can't, like killing any animal anyway, big red flag. But the fact that he has gone after a neighbor's cat and he knew this neighbor, he was somewhat friendly with this neighbor. And the neighbor found out because they saw Eric holding their cat. They saw Eric holding the cat's lifeless body. And the neighbor was absolutely horrified, quite rightly so. His antisocial behavior as well started to get worse. He was just really, really angry and he wanted to take out his anger on anyone around him. That's probably why he killed the neighbor's cat because he wanted to take his anger out on someone. He also became somewhat of a bully himself. And now he looks for people that he deems weaker than him so he can bully them. And whenever anyone would say hi to him, he would just give them this really scary, emotionless stare. The whole time I was doing my research, obviously I was coming across images of Eric and he always just has that cold, dead stare. And I'm telling you, there is something in his eyes that really just really creep me out and scare me. He's becoming even more isolated. At one point, he even threatens a teacher and says that he wants to kill them. He is becoming physically violent at home. He also one time lashes out physically at Ted and I don't condone physical violence, okay? But him physically assaulting Ted is something that I don't really care about. And at this point, when Eric is 13, he was telling his stepdad, Ted, that he wanted to hurt people. He is expressing that he has this anger and violence inside of him and he actually wants to hurt people. This is a major red flag. And Ted, being the stand-up guy that he is, told Eric, go take it out on a punching bag or a tree. Go do something, just go punch something. So what did Eric go and do? He went and punched a tree and it didn't solve anything, shock. And this is what really frustrates me about this case is that Eric was actually saying he wants to hurt people. He was basically asking for help and for guidance. This would have been the perfect time for his parents, Tammy and Ted and Randy, if Randy ever bothered to show up. This would have been the perfect time to maybe get Eric some help. He is being physically violent to people in the home. He is killing animals and I'm pretty sure his parents were aware of this. He is acting out in the neighborhood. He is acting out at school. And don't forget that he smokes at least one pack of cigarettes every single day. His behavior is crying out for help. And again, I'm not excusing what Eric goes on to do, not at all, but the parents need to parent here. They needed to step in, they needed to do something, but they didn't. Even though this is an escalation of behavior, you can see where this is going. And soon enough, a completely young, sweet, innocent child would get pulled into this. And this sweet, young, innocent child was Derek Roby. Derek Roby was born on the 2nd of October, 1988. And in 1993, when this case takes place, Derek was only four years old. He lived in the same small town as Eric, which is Savona, New York. And Derek lived with his parents, Dale and Doreen, and his younger brother, who was 18 months old, Dalton. As a young child, Derek was described as curious, 
confident, fearless, and energetic. He loved having fun. He loved playing practical jokes. He was a lovely little boy that had a heart of gold and he adored his younger brother and loved spending time with Dalton. He was just one of these kids that embraced life. He was always up for anything. He always had a smile on his face. He always wanted to get stuck into everything. He cared so deeply for animals and he actually really loved earthworms that he used to collect in his garden and he used to give them cute little names. Derek also loved playing sports and his favorite sport was t-ball and Derek also just loved getting involved in the community. He was actually given the title the unofficial mayor of Savona because he would literally just sit down and start waving to everybody as if he was like the mayor and he was just loved by so many people. He had this cheeky little grin. Come on, Dave, come here. Keep reeling. I got him. Derek's first big fish, yay! So now we get to Monday the 2nd of August, 1993. At this point, the local summer camp was taking place in Savona and Derek was attending. He loved summer camp. I mean, what do you expect? He loves getting involved in everything. And on August the 2nd, he was running late to summer camp and he was really anxious about getting to summer camp because he was already running late and he needed to get to the recreational park to play t-ball, which was his favorite sport. But his young younger brother Dalton, he was currently teething, he had sore gums, he was being a bit fussy and Derek's mom Doreen was naturally distracted by Dalton and it was already 10 past 9 and Derek needed to be at summer camp for 9 so he was already 10 minutes late. So Derek was pleading with his mom, he was saying mom please let me just walk on my own, it's only a block away, I'll be fine, I don't want to be late anymore. I mean he's only 4 years old, he is exactly 2 months months away from being five, but she had never let Derek go anywhere on his own before. She was really apprehensive. She was like, uh, I don't think so. Like, no. But Derek was pleading and pleading, please, mom, please, mom, please let me go. I don't want to miss out. And Doreen starts to think, oh, should I just let him walk on his own? It's only a block away. He has walked that route hundreds of times. He knows the way. We live in a very small town. Nothing bad ever happens. Everyone knows each other. So in the end, Doreen allows Derek to walk to summer camp on his own. A decision that she would regret for the rest of her life. So Derek starts making his way to the park. It is currently 9.15 a.m. And over at the park, the day's activities were already getting underway, but there was also someone else hanging around the park. And who was that? It was Eric Smith. Eric wasn't a part of summer camp. He had actually just decided to ride down there that morning to cause some trouble. That's what he wanted to do. He was riding his bike around. He was just being a bit of a nuisance. And the camp leader at one point actually had to tell Eric off and tell him to go away. And after being told off, Eric cycles off in a huff. He's really angry. He starts feeling sorry for himself. He starts thinking, why am I always the victim? I don't want to be the victim anymore. I want someone else to be my victim. And at that very moment when Eric is cycling away, he spots tiny Derek clutching onto his lunch bag and he decides to take his anger out on Derek. Oh God, oh God, I don't normally get emotional this quickly. I've got to give a warning now. This next bit is... um not going to be easy to listen to. My God, I can't put myself together. So as soon as Eric spots Derek, he cycles up to him and he starts saying, hey kid, hey kid. Now Derek, he has been told by his parents, don't talk to strangers, stranger danger. So Derek is keeping his head down. He's probably very nervous right now that this stranger and Eric, even though he's 13, he would still be a big kid to Derek, who's only four. He's probably nervous that this big kid is approaching him on a bike. But Eric goes right up to Derek and he says, hey kid, I know you're going to the park. I can show you a shortcut. And Derek, like I said, is very nervous. And all he says is, 
I'm not supposed to. Now, it can be assumed that Derek is saying, I'm not supposed to, i.e. I'm not supposed to talk to strangers. But Eric is insistent. He's like, it's okay, it's okay. Like, I know a shortcut, you'll be safe. So Derek agrees to go with Eric. And this just truly breaks my heart because Derek, he was doing the right thing. He was like, no, I'm not supposed to. And children we know are very quick to trust people in general. But it's safe to assume that a child would trust another child very quickly. And this is exactly what Derek does. He trusts Eric because he is another child. So Eric puts his bike down and he starts walking with Derek and he takes Derek into a near woodland area. This is just off the road but it's a very dense woodland area. As soon as you get just a little bit into this woodland area no one can see you. And just a few yards into the woods this is when Eric decides to launch his attack on Derek. So Eric is just a few paces behind Derek and Eric reaches out and grabs Derek's neck and just begins to strangle him. Immediately, little Derek starts to fight back, which I don't think Eric was expecting. Derek starts to kick and swing his arms, trying to break free, and he actually does break free. But sadly, the attack is not over. Derek, even though he does have a lot of fight in him, he is so small, he is so young, he is so vulnerable. His legs are only so big, he can't really run away either. And Eric just launches on him again. He places both of his hands around Derek's neck and just starts to choke him again. After he has his hands around Derek's throat for about 30 seconds, Derek drops to the ground. But even though he was on the floor, he couldn't move. He was still gasping for air. It was at this point that Eric grabbed Derek's bag out of his hand, got his lunchbox, emptied out his lunch onto the floor and inside his lunchbox was a paper napkin and Eric grabs the napkin and shoves it into Derek's mouth, trying to choke him again, trying to cut off his air supply. But as he was doing this, Derek bit down on Eric's finger. But sadly, this seemed to almost spur Eric on. It seemed to make him even more furious and the attack got more vicious because Eric picked up a nearby rock and used it to strike Derek three times in the head. At this point, Derek had stopped moving, but Eric was not done yet. He actually went to find a larger rock. He found one that weighed 26 pounds. Eric actually struggled to even pick up this rock. Can you imagine how big this would have been? 26 pounds. And Eric holding this 26 pound rock dropped it from a height onto Derek's small body. He then proceeded to do this two more times. Following this, Eric decided he needed a break because this was hard work. He then went through the lunch that he had scattered on the floor. He picked up some red Kool-Aid and he's just started to drink. He needed a refreshment. And then with the Kool-Aid, he started to pour the Kool-Aid onto Derek's body into the wounds that he had created. And then finally, in one last horrific act, Eric picked up a stick from the woods, pulled Derek's pants down and used the stick to sodomize Derek's body. Following this, Eric then dragged Derek's body further into the woods so no one would see it. He then decided to pose Derek's body. He took off Derek's shoes and he placed the left shoe by his right hand and his right shoe by his left hand. He then took out some more of his anger on Derek's lunch. He stamped and squished on his lunch particularly the banana. He then wiped off the blood that he had on his hands onto his pants. He left the woodland area, picked up his bike and returned to the park. But then just five minutes after he did this, he wanted to go back and check that Derek really was dead. So he went back to Derek's body just to make sure that he really was dead. And sadly, Derek was. At some point in that attack, Derek had lost his life. He had lost his life due to blunt force trauma to the head. And I can't believe that I've just said that. Can you believe that a 13 year old has just committed all of that to a four year old? I think what always just gets me is when I think about how small Derek was and how defenseless he was and how scared he must have been and alone. And Eric, I just want to point out, 
does not have any remorse at all. Because over the next hour, he returns to Derek's body several times. And he visits Derek's body several times because he gets a sick and twisted enjoyment out of it. However, a couple of hours later, it had started to pour down with rain. So all of the kids at this summer camp were sent home. By this time as well, Eric had also returned home himself. Now Doreen, Derek's mom, could see that all of the other kids were returning home and she was expecting Derek home at any moment. But of course, Derek didn't return home and she felt so panicked. I have watched a documentary where she is on it and she's talking about this moment and there was a moment earlier on in the day where she just felt this like almost sensation, this cold wave go through her and she just knew that something bad had happened but then she just brushed off that feeling but now she thinks that when she felt that sensation that was the moment that Derek actually lost his life. So she is panicking right now because her son hasn't returned home. She calls the police. And this was a really tight knit community. The word got out pretty quickly that Derek was missing. And it was a whole community effort trying to find Derek. The police were out there. Even Eric's family were trying to find Derek. And even Eric himself joined the search party. Four hours pass, still everyone is searching. But then finally at around 3.45 p.m., a scream can be heard coming from the woodland area next to the park. And this is where a woman who was a part of the search party discovers Derek's body. And of course, this is when Derek's parents realized that their worst fear had come true. Derek was no longer a missing child. This was now a murder investigation. And Derek's parents, understandably, were inconsolable. I can't even imagine the pain that a parent would go through in that moment. So now the police need to find who did this. And the story of Derek's murder reached far and wide. Parents were absolutely terrified in the community that there was this stranger on the loose murdering children. Because initially everyone did think that the person responsible for Derek's murder was a stranger, an outsider, someone not from the town, an older person, a paedophile, which your mind would go there, wouldn't it? And when the police examined Derek's body, he had absolutely horrific injuries. He had multiple head injuries, multiple skull fractures, swelling on the brain, cuts all over his chest, perforation of the intestinal wall, and of course the stick was found inside of Derek after he was sodomized. And police automatically started to think, okay, this is going to be an older person that has done this, an outsider. They started looking at the sex offender register. Were any sex offenders in the area? Has anybody recently been being released from prison that could possibly be a suspect. The police even started to look at some of the adults that were a part of the community, but not once, not once did the police consider that a child had done this. The police interviewed everyone in the area, which included the children that were at the summer camp, and it even included Eric himself, because Eric was very forthcoming about telling people that he was in the area. He was on his bike. But in Eric's initial interview by the police, Eric didn't really give much away, but Eric's mom, Tammy, could tell that there was something wrong with her son. She didn't think that he was the killer, wanna stress that, but she thought that there was something wrong. She could tell that he was holding something back. She thought that Eric may have witnessed something, that he may be helpful in some kind of way. So three days after that interview, she calls the police to her house to interview Eric again, because she really does think that Eric can help this investigation. And this is when Eric decides to open up. He actually does tell the police, oh yes, I did see Derek that morning. I saw him at 9.15 a.m. I was on my bike, he was walking to summer camp. And he said that he just rode past him. It was nothing more than that. He was on his bike and he rode past him. So the police ask Eric, can you give us any more details? Can you tell us, for example, what Derek was wearing on that day? Now, Eric, he starts to get a little bit uncomfortable and he starts saying, oh, I didn't really see that much. I didn't have my glasses on, so I couldn't really see that well. But then Eric goes on to describe exactly down to the T what Derek was wearing on that morning. And the police were a little bit suspicious. They were like, hang on a minute, you were on your bike on the other side of the park and you also didn't have your glasses on. How did you see that much? Because Eric, his eyesight was really poor without his glasses. So they were suspicious, 
They didn't suspect that he was the murderer, but they were suspicious. So then the police ask Eric to reenact what happened that morning. And Eric is more than happy to do so. He is more than happy to help and get involved in this investigation, which again, I think is really creepy because we have covered murderers that like to insert themselves into investigations. But we have to remember here that Eric is 13 years old. So Eric does his little demonstration. He gets on his bike and the police stand where Derek stood on that morning. And during this reenactment, Eric obviously didn't have his glasses on and Eric couldn't see the police officer very well. So then again, this made the police officers very suspicious. I want to stress again, they still didn't think that he was the murderer, but they did think that he knew more than what he was letting on. But there were a couple more red flags during Eric's interview. So during the interview, Eric is offered a drink. He is offered a glass of red Kool-Aid. And as soon as Eric sees that Kool-Aid, he completely loses it and throws the Kool-Aid on the floor. Again, the police officers were suspicious of this because the police officers knew about the red Kool-Aid at the crime scene and what was done with the Kool-Aid, that it was poured into Derek's wounds. So they were like, does this mean something? The police officers were pushing Derek, saying, do you know something? You can tell us, you can open up, blah, blah, blah. Another red flag is that during the interview, Eric says, I'm not the type of person to kill or sexually molest anyone. And at this point in the investigation, the details of Derek's injuries had not been released to the public, let alone that Derek was sodomized with a stick. So why would Eric say that he wouldn't sexually molest anyone? And then finally, after getting really frustrated in the interview, Eric starts banging his fists on the table. And he says angrily, you think I killed him? don't you? Again, this is very suspicious behavior, but I still want to stress the police did not suspect that he was the murderer. They just thought maybe he witnessed the murder, which is why he knows these details. No one even wanted to entertain the fact that Eric could be the killer. So over the next few days, the investigation continues and Eric's behavior is still so strange. There are still so many red flags. First of all, when Eric's family ask Eric about what he had seen, etc., there are just so many inconsistencies. He slightly changes the story all the time. But then possibly the biggest red flag is that over those few days of the investigation, Eric repeatedly asks adults, what would the punishment be if the murderer was a child? If you are an adult and Eric is asking you this, surely it must be crossing your mind. Could Eric have done this. But there were a couple more red flags. Over those few days where the investigation has continued, Eric stays at a family friend's house a few times. And this family friend have a 15 year old son called Jason, who is pretty friendly with Eric. So Eric is staying in Jason's bedroom. In the middle of the night, Eric woke up. He lit a cigarette, of course, don't forget that he smokes a pack of cigarettes every day. And he started burning Jason's nose with the cigarette when Jason was sleeping. Obviously he woke up, but the burns were pretty severe. The skin had started to blister. Oh my God, this is terrifying. This is absolutely terrifying. Now I'm not saying that Eric was going to kill Jason. I am not saying that at all. But what is concerning is that Eric has already killed. It's almost like he has gotten the taste for violence, for inflicting pain on others. And the fact that only, what, a few days after the murder, he is already displaying violent behavior towards other children is very, very concerning. Now, everyone around Eric at this point was thinking, what the hell is going on? There is something going on with Eric. He knows something. And there was a little intervention. Eric was there. Eric's parents were there. Eric's grandparents were there. And even Eric's great granddad was there. And all of these adults are pressing Eric, telling Eric, come clean. What do you know? Now, after half an hour of Eric not saying anything, he was probably just sat there like this. Then all of a sudden, Eric deciding that he could no longer hold it in. Eric turned to his mom and said, quote, mom, I did it. I snapped and I did it. 
I'm sorry, mom. I killed that little boy. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. They truly did think that he had witnessed something, not that he was the killer. Now, Eric's great granddad, he was an ex-sheriff himself. He called the police straight away. And Eric was picked up and taken to the police station. And Eric decided to give a full confession. And as he was giving this confession, as the story was progressing, Eric was visibly, and you could tell in his voice, he was getting more and more excited. He got enjoyment out of reliving the murder. Everyone in the room was completely shocked that they were hearing this 13 year old talk about the horrific murder that he had carried out. Now, by the time Eric went to trial, it was almost a year after the murder. The county court is now in session. The Honorable Battle G. Purple Jr. presiding. The trial of the People versus Eric Smith is finally underway. And the media had a field day with this case. They decided to give Eric a nickname. They called him the Freckle-Faced killer. Now, I'm not always the biggest fan when the media give these killers a nickname, but why are we giving them a nickname based on their appearance? But there was a fascination surrounding this case because Eric was a child. He was only 13 years old when he carried out this murder. The courtroom was packed. There was also cameras in the courtroom. Eric's defense went through Eric's troubling background about his development problems, about the bullying, about the situation with his home life. They tried to paint a picture that Eric was also a victim, that this should be considered. They also said that Eric was not in control of his actions. Eric was suffering with depression. He also had a nicotine addiction. I've never heard a nicotine addiction be used as a defense for murder before, but that is what they were going with. And they also said that Eric had something called intermittent explosive disorder. Now the prosecution were having none of this. They got doctors in and the doctors ran a load of tests on Eric. And by the end of the tests, nothing was wrong with him. At least nothing to explain his actions. Throughout the trial, Eric just had this eerily blank stare on his face. It truly is scary. He was just so emotionless throughout the trial. He didn't even say sorry. There was one thing during the trial that really riled people up. And that is one day Eric entered the courtroom wearing a top with the cartoon, the Tasmanian devil on it. And you're probably wondering, okay, what's so bad about that? And there is plenty wrong with that. First of all, the Tasmanian Devil was Derek's favorite cartoon to watch on TV. But not only that, the day that Derek was murdered, he was wearing a t-shirt with the Tasmanian Devil on it. And Eric, of course, he knows exactly what Derek was wearing on that day. He was able to describe it down to a T. That should not have been allowed. I don't even care if Eric likes the Tasmanian Devil. His defense team should not have allowed that to happen. But the main question that everyone wanted to know was why did Eric do this? And Eric has tried to say that it was nothing to do with Derek. It was nothing personal. Eric said that it could have been anyone. Eric also said that when he was murdering Derek, his anger wasn't directed at Derek. It was directed at all of the people that had bullied him. And by the end of the trial, the jury unanimously found Eric guilty of second degree murder. And he was sentenced to nine years to life in prison, which is a bit of a strange sentence, nine years to life. But I assume it was because Eric was so young when he committed the murder. So Eric was sent to a juvenile detention center where he stayed until he was 21 years old and then he was transferred to an adult prison. And then in 2004, at the age of 24, after spending 11 years in prison, Eric was up for parole. And at this parole hearing, he revealed some pretty shocking things. He revealed that he got pleasure out of murdering Derek. And he also revealed that if he wasn't caught, he would have murdered again, which is terrifying. He has literally just admitted that he would have become a serial killer without a shadow of a doubt. And to no surprise, his parole was denied. But now Eric was up for parole every two 
years, which was absolutely horrendous for Derek's parents because every two years they had to relive what happened. So two years later, he was up for parole. It was denied. Two years later, up for parole again, denied. Eric even did a TV interview pleading that his anger wasn't directed at Derek. He was a changed person and he had remorse for what he had done. My anger wasn't directed at Derek at all. It was directed at all the other guys who used to pick on me. When I was torturing and killing Derek, that was what I saw in my head. I'm not the same person. But again, even after this interview, every time he went up for parole, it kept being denied. Now, I think that this is a pretty good time to bring up the case of James Bulger, which is the case that I mentioned in the beginning of this video that is very similar to today's case. And the two 10-year-old boys, John Venables and Robert Thompson, they both went to prison for what they had done and they were both released from prison. They were released after only serving eight years in prison. Now, when they were released, they were given new identities and they both have lived very different lives when they have been out of prison. So we have Robert Thompson, who since he has been released from prison, he has kept his head down. He hasn't gotten into trouble with the law as far as we're aware, because obviously we don't know his identity. He is in a relationship and he seems to be living a somewhat normal life. But then we have John Venables, which... um. He has gone down a completely different path. He has been in trouble with the law on and off since he has been released. He has been to prison multiple times since his initial release. And what are John's offences since he has been released from prison? Well, all of his offences are to do with child pornography, indecent images. He is actually, as far as I'm aware, in prison right now. And when he was arrested for this last time, the time that he's in now, he actually had a paedophile manual on him that detailed how to groom children and how to get away with it. He was also found in possession of over 1,200 indecent images of children. And the reason why I wanted to bring up the case of James Bulger is that I think it's a really good example of child killers and what can happen if they're released from prison. So now we get back to Eric Smith of today's case. And in October 2021, he was up for parole again. He was aged 41 at the time of this parole hearing. And after many failed attempts, this time his parole was granted. And in February of 2022, Eric Smith was released from prison. As far as I'm aware, he is currently living in Queens, New York, and he is out there living his life. Apparently, he wants to work with children as a counsellor to children that have been bullied. And I don't think that he should be working with children, full stop. I don't know if he is working with children, by the way. I just know that that is what he wants to do. And I really hope, truly from the bottom of my heart, that he goes down the same path as Robert Thompson in the James Bulger case, where he doesn't commit any more crime. He has been rehabilitated. But I'm not gonna lie, I'm, I'm not, I am worried. I am very worried that Eric Smith has been released. I mean, there were so many red flags in his childhood. The fact that he had the McDonald triad, the fact that he has admitted that he would kill again if he wasn't caught for the first murder. But you guys are gonna have to let me know what your thoughts are. Do you think that someone like Eric can be rehabilitated? I definitely think that it is a bit of a polarizing opinion on whether people can be rehabilitated. And I do think that people can be rehabilitated, but then there are some people that just can't be. I'm probably siding on the fence that someone like Eric can't be fully rehabilitated. And now I want to finish this video talking about Derek Roby. Derek Roby was described as a caring, cheeky and confident young boy. He loved having fun. He loved spending time with his family. He loved being out in his community and he absolutely loved playing his favourite sport, t-ball. He always had so much love to give and everyone knew him as the unofficial mayor of Savona. He loved his family dearly 
family, especially his younger brother Dalton. He was such a sweet little boy with a massive heart and he was taken far, far too soon. He was only four years old. It's just so tragic that a four-year-old lost their life in today's case and my heart truly goes out to Derek's parents. And there is one more thing to mention is that a year after this tragic murder, a statue was unveiled in memory of Derek Roby. The statue is near the local park and the statue is of Derek playing his favorite sport t-ball. And then just last year in 2022, the park next to where the statue is was renovated and renamed the Derek J. Roby Memorial Field in Derek's honor. And that brings us to the end of today's case. If you did want to know more about this case, because there are a few more details, I found a really good book when I was doing my research. So I'll leave a link to that book in the description box. So as always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below, because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to Love and Pies for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget you can download the game using my link in the description box. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.